the news for you. News Channel 4 at 6 is next. You're watching NBC4 HD. And now, Linda Baccaro, David Ushery, Janice Huff, and Len Berman. This is News Channel 4 at 6. First tonight, gunfire on the Upper East Side. I'm the commander in Iraq. I've given you my best professional military advice. The general speaks, but will America and Congress believe what Petraeus has to say? A manhunt for a confessed killer after he walks out of custody. And the man who took on a would-be robber half his age and won. Good evening, Give everyone. Your wallet, old man. I said, are you kidding? Good evening, everyone. Shortly after school let out, gunfire rang out on the Upper East Side. Several witnesses, including many families, heard or saw the shots go off in the bustling neighborhood. One person was struck. Josh Einiger is live at 93rd Street and 1st Avenue with the latest on the shooting. Josh? And Linda, I'm right alongside the side of the Isaacs houses. Right here is where the gunfire first broke out. And then witnesses told me they watched the victim run right down the middle of First Avenue as rush hour was getting underway. And when he got down to 92nd Street, he made a left turn right there, running east on 92nd. He got several dozen paces before he collapsed in front of a parked bus. Paramedics rushed him to an area hospital, and tonight we're still awaiting word on his condition. In the meantime, this all happened in front of several families, several dozen families, who had been enjoying what was a peaceful afternoon. Like boom, 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 quick, like Dodge City. He was running, and he had like three shots in his back, and he passed out in front of the bus over there. It's a safe um, neighborhood for the most part. We have a very we, good police we, presence. Um, we, um, this is an um, aberration. And back with a live look right now in front of that garbage can, the baseball hat on First Avenue, police say was dropped by either the suspect or the victim in this case. They're trying to figure that out as they search for the suspect. Meanwhile, right over there, that grocery store has been incorporated into the crime scene. We saw investigators from the Taru unit of the NYPD in there. That's the unit that looks for surveillance video and high-tech digital surveillance systems. So there's the possibility maybe this might have been caught on tape. Of course, we'll continue to follow the progress in the search for this suspect who tonight remains at large and First Avenue remains shut down for people trying to leave Manhattan in the middle of the evening rush. First Avenue severely backed up tonight. Of course, we'll keep you posted as this continues to develop. But for now, we're live on the Upper East Side. Josh Heidegger, News Channel 4. Josh, thank you for those late details. And now we turn to the long-awaited Iraq War report from General David Petraeus. He told Congress this afternoon that some American troops could be coming home this month. But Petraeus' upbeat assessment of President Bush's so-called surge left many Democrats and anti-war critics questioning the accuracy and motivation of the general. Our political reporter, J.D. Dapter, has been observing the developments and is here now. Jay? Well, before Petraeus even got to speak to the House committees uh, this afternoon, he first had to listen to 45 minutes of partisan posturing, not unusual in Washington. Democrats on the committee laying out why they doubted much of what they were about to hear. Republicans claiming shock, shock at the suggestion that Petraeus was really doing the White House's bidding. When General Petraeus finally got to testify, he made his case simply and repeatedly. As a bottom line up front, the military objectives of the surge are in large measure being met. Aided by chart after chart purporting to show decreases in violence throughout most of Iraq, the general said the surge was working and could slowly be ended over the next 10 months. I believe that we will be able to reduce our forces to the pre-surge level of brigade combat teams by next summer without jeopardizing the security gains that we have fought so hard to achieve. As for when the 130,000 other U.S. troops might begin coming home, Petraeus said he won't be able to talk about that until next March. Democrats were quick to question the general's assumptions, especially in light of several States recent independent assessments of Iraq that reached that opposite conclusions from his. The administration has sent you here today to convince the members of these two committees and the Congress that victory is at hand. With all due respect to you, I must say, I don't buy it. Please remove them. Petraeus was interrupted repeatedly by anti-war protesters, echoing a full-page ad in the New York Times by the liberal group MoveOn.org today, which argued Petraeus is just towing the White House line. He said, not so. I wrote this testimony myself. It has not been cleared by nor shared with anyone in the Pentagon, the White House, or the Congress until it was just handed out. 
But Petraeus has been a political animal before, writing a pre-election op-ed in the Washington Post that was very optimistic and, in hindsight, largely incorrect. And the Post reported today that a White House public relations guru has been coordinating with Petraeus for the last uh, few the weeks in how to, quote, sell the us. surge. Uh, Remember that the surge was supposed to give the Iraqi government the breathing space it needed to make political progress. Well, today, Petraeus was very careful to say there has been much less political progress in Iraq than there has been military progress. Tomorrow, he will testify before two different Senate committees, and the president is expected now to make a speech about the Iraq war and what comes next later in the week. Thank right. you, Jay. Thank you, J.D. Osama bin Laden is scheduled to surface again. He's expected to in a new tape, reading the last testament of one of the hijackers on this, the eve of the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Now, this comes just days after bin Laden appeared in his first video message in three years. Al-Qaeda says the terror mastermind will read the last testament of Abu Musab Walid al-Shari. In years past, the terror group has marked the anniversary with similar tapes. For the first time in six years, a ceremony marking the September 11th terror attacks is not being held at Ground Zero because of construction. New York Governor Spitzer and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi toured the site today. Tim Minton is live in Lower Manhattan with more on that story. Tim? Linda, we're in Zuccotti Park, which actually is a larger space than what has been used for the previous five anniversaries. You can probably hear behind me, school groups have been rehearsing for singing tomorrow that is part of the program, all on a day when officials from Washington and Albany were also here. On her first visit to Ground Zero as Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi promised much more help is on the way for people who got sick after 9-11 due to toxic contamination from the attack. You will have friends in the Congress of the United States. Welcome news for victims like Joe Whittleder, a former NYPD officer whose desperate lung problems developed from working at Ground Zero on and after the attack. Married with two children, it took two years to get a 9-11 based disability retirement. If I was dead, I would, my wife and children would have been treated better if I would have got killed on 9-11 than a slow death. A new investigation by Discover magazine announced today reveals there could be up to 300,000 post 9-11 victims like Whittleder and attorney Robert Gulak, who suffers from exposure at his downtown office. As long as the World Trade Center contamination remains in our offices and homes claiming more victims for Al-Qaeda, September 11, 2001 is not over. The speaker's visit to the World Trade Center site, which followed a meeting with Mayor Bloomberg at City Hall, was a look forward at what it will become with rebuilding now well underway. Without a doubt, the most breathtaking urban environment in the world. On this anniversary eve, as a memorial quilt sewn in six countries and 30 U.S. states was dedicated, the medical examiner's office briefed family members, including Marie Mitchell, whose firefighter brother died 9-11, on new technology now being used to identify remains. The presentation today was not only a reaffirmation of their commitment to the human element of this, this project, um, but also the, an incredible update on the new technology, the ability to now identify remains that they couldn't identify before. And as the rehearsals continue here in Zuccotti Park, something on the schedule just so that you have an understanding, it will start at 8.40 tomorrow morning. The program here, there will be, as there have been in the past reading of all the names, 2,750 victims up one from last year officially. Four pauses will occur at the times when airplanes went into the Twin Towers and when the towers came down. That's the schedule for tomorrow. We're live in Lower Manhattan. Tim Minton, News Channel 4. And Tim, before you go, Janice tells us that the area could be hit hard by heavy rains in the morning. How would any rain affect tomorrow's schedule of events? Well, simply put, the schedule will go on. The programs will go on. City Hall, the mayor's office, says that they are going to supply some umbrellas but do expect that many people will bring their own because otherwise there won't be enough. As one person at City Hall put it today, there's no rain date for 9-11. Absolutely. Tim Minton, thank you very much. And News Channel 4 will provide live coverage of tomorrow's commemoration ceremony at Zuccotti Park beginning at 8.25 a.m. Linda, a confessed killer is on the loose, and New Jersey State Police consider him dangerous. William Enman walked away from a psychiatric hospital last night in Hamilton. 
Edmund confessed to a double murder in 1975. Reg Chapman reports now on the manhunt. The search is on for William Edmund, a killer who authorities say walked away from Ancora Psychiatric Hospital in Camden County. His privileges that he had at the hospital allowed for unsupervised uh, walks in a uh, obviously unsecure area. According to Morris County Prosecutor Robert Bianchi, the 64-year-old was on such a walk a little after 2 p.m. Saturday and was expected to return 50 minutes later, but he never did. Bianchi says Enman has been in a number of psychiatric hospitals since he confessed to two murders. Mr. Enman again was found not guilty by reason of insanity for the murder of a father and the four-year-old son with a nightstick. Morris County Sheriff's Department is involved in the search because, according to Bianchi, Enman's last contact with society was in the Morris County area. According to the Morris County Prosecutor, reports of William Inman's history of incidents inside that psychiatric hospital makes him believe that this escaped patient is a danger to the community. The murders happened here on Johnson Road in Morris Plains, and some who live there now say word of Inman's escape has them on guard. I'm not spooked, but I'm concerned because it is a very, very quiet neighborhood, and anybody that would be a stranger walking around here, you would detect them very easily. Bianchi says Inman was last seen with a backpack and in possession of camping and survival equipment. They're concerned he may be in a wooded area nearby or trying to get to Nova Scotia where he has property. Take another look at William Inman. He is 5 foot 9 inches tall, weighs 145 pounds. He has a slight to medium build and has graying brown hair. If you know of his whereabouts, call police. In Morristown, Reg Chapman, News Channel 4. A Nassau County police officer is recovering tonight after being hit by a car during a traffic stop along the Long Island Expressway. It happened between exits 39 and 40 in Old Westbury. Police say the driver of the car did not stop and the officer was taken to the hospital with a broken arm. Today, attorneys for a man who murdered five people in a Queens fast food restaurant asked the state's highest court to spare his life. 43-year-old John Taylor is on death row for the May 2000 robbery and mass murder at a Wendy's in which seven people were shot execution style. Taylor's attorney argued that even the worst terrorists should not face the death penalty. That is your argument. You're saying that we, just, just as we would not boil Osama bin Laden in oil, we should not execute him. Your Honor, it's, it's not just my argument. It's the law of this court that, that, A, that retribution has no, and that's principally what we're talking about when we invoke those names, I think, mm -hmm. that retribution is not a legitimate penological goal in New York. In 2004, the Court of Appeals ruled the state's death penalty statute unconstitutional, but the Queens District Attorney argues that ruling should not apply in Taylor's case. When News Channel 4 at 6 continues, he's 74 and a force to be reckoned with how this man fought off an armed robber half his age. And off to civil court, the latest in the case against the Knicks' Isaiah Thomas. Next. Coming up tonight at 7 on New York Nightly News, a security threat against Mayor Bloomberg. It's a story you'll see first right here. Plus the cell phone fight in city schools. Tonight a call for change, but will it make a difference? Coming up at 7. You could describe him as Mr. Crime Stopper. A 74-year-old Bayshore man managed to fend off a would-be mugger, even helping police make the arrest. Our Long Island reporter Greg Circle has the story. You protected yourself. I protected myself. To his neighbors, Bruce Ferraro's now a kind of folk hero. The 74-year-old's bravado in this mall parking lot, the stuff of legend. I think it's wonderful. Maybe it, they'll think twice about attacking an older person. Ferraro had just returned to his car after a walk around South Shore Mall when he was confronted by a man brandishing a tire iron. I got out of the car. He says, give me your, give me your, give me a wallet, old man. I said, are you kidding? Ferraro then wrestled the weapon from a man police identify as John McAvoy, a guy half Ferraro's age and a whole lot bigger than him. He was uh, about six foot four, 250 pounds. I don't know how big the, the victim was, but uh, he, was, he was fortunate that he was able to fight him off and the, the uh, robber ran away. To make matters worse for McAvoy, police say his car stalled and he had to flee on foot before being arrested. Ferraro suffered some bruises, but otherwise wasn't hurt. Still, police are calling his actions potentially dangerous. So why did the former Army vet fight back? You, were, were you angry? When he called me old man, yeah. You didn't like that? I didn't like that. You know, take my money, but you don't have to rub it in. South Shore Mall officials refused comment on the incident, saying only that they believe the combination of security forces and electronic surveillance are enough to keep shoppers safe here. I think he's a hero, but I think... 
I hope he'll be a little wiser next time. The retired highway worker admits he was lucky this time, but hopes he taught the bad guys a valuable lesson. Don't mess with the elderly. Greg Sergal, News Channel 4. Knicks coach Isaiah Thomas was in court today as the sexual harassment case against him moves forward. Thomas walked into court for the start of jury selection. The former NBA star turned basketball executive is being sued by the Knicks' former marketing director. She's seeking $10 million, claiming Thomas fired her after she refused unwanted sexual advances. Thomas denies the allegations. Apparently, with fire violations corrected, students in Patterson returned to school this morning. All 52 schools were shut down on Friday, just the second day of the new school year, after violations were discovered in half the city's school buildings. They range from stalled elevators to missing smoke detectors. But today, excited children and relieved parents were welcomed back to schools that one district official said were, quote, ready to run. The New York City Council has approved a massive redevelopment plan for Jamaica. The Jamaica plan calls for 368 blocks of new development near JFK Airport, including 5,200 new housing units and 3 million square feet of commercial space. It also includes additional open space and new trees along neighborhood streets. And it takes steps to make sure that the new development will be compatible with working class neighborhoods nearby. Mayor Bloomberg says the Jamaica plan will create 9,500 jobs. Up next, Lenwood Sports. Well, we will have the medical report as Eli and the Giants limp out of Dallas. Who's hurt and how much? And we'll check out Chad Pennington, plus possible charges of spying, some intrigue here. Next in sports on News Channel 4 at 6. Oprah's bash for Obama in Santa Barbara. Now, Britney's back. Her comeback performance at the VMAs. Sean, backstage as Britney gets off the stage. Next, Access Hollywood. Tonight at 7.30 on NBC4 HD. Tonight, women's health. What you need to know for a long and healthy life. The Secret to Her Success, a special series. NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams tonight. Let's hear now, beginning with some rather ugly football. Right? Can you play any D? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I got to do better than that. Can anyone play defense? Jets and Giants gave up 83 points combined. No team gave up more points than they did yesterday. Needless to say, no defense, no wins. More important, here's the injury story. Eli Manning getting tossed around in Dallas, suffering a bruised shoulder. He is denying an ESPN report that the shoulder is separated. Just a bruise, he says. He is day-to-day. Running back Brandon Jacobs leaving the game in the second quarter, spraining his right knee. He is listed as week to week. OCU Minora injuring his left knee on this tackle in the first quarter. He is listed as day to day. Not the way Manning and company plan to start the season. They said, you know, all everything is probably as good as it could be uh, from the test results. It's just a matter of when, when, when do you have the strength and when, when you feel you can throw it, um, you know, full full strength and you, you'll be out there playing basically all we gotta do is move forward man i can't i can't i don't have no solution no answer for that to be honest with you we got whoever's next in line they got to step up and do a great job for us there you go show up and play green bay is here sunday only jet fans know what they were thinking but it appears they were happy that chad pennington got injured and knocked out of the game third quarter pennington gets his leg caught up under jarvis green of the patriots he gallantly tried to get up Tried to leave under his own power. Fans actually cheered as he left, and they cheered some more when Kellen Clemens came in to replace him. Pretty tacky. Playing the season, and this is the wrong reaction to bringing in Kellen Clemens, who has been. Jets are calling Pennington's injury day to day. Sad situation. It is the ankle, same as as what was announced during the game, and we'll review it through the course of the week. After the game, Pennington headed straight for the trainer's room, and he was not at practice today, so Clemens could get the start when the Jets play Sunday in Baltimore. At this point, I've had it, you know, it's my second year in the offense. Um, had a chance to uh, get some live bullets, especially this last week. Um, so I'm going to go in there and do it the best I can. And following yesterday's game with New England, some intrigue. The NFL is confirming that they have confiscated the camera and tape of a Patriots employee on the sideline. He was possibly Looks stealing like Jets' defensive here, signals. Ah, that's why the Jets' defense two. stunk. It was espionage. Along those lines, those are all league-related matters, and, and anything that's, that deals with, with an issue like this, it's, it's all league matter. 
And the news today, not good for Buffalo tight end Kevin Everett. Doctors say the chances are slim that he will regain full body motion. He suffered a spinal cord injury in yesterday's game against Denver. And in baseball, the Yankees are off today in Toronto tomorrow. They've opened a four-game lead in the wild card. The Mets hosting the Braves tonight. In tennis, Roger Federer continues to dominate. It's now a dozen majors, although the popular Novak Djokovic is kicking himself today. He had seven set points in the first two sets of yesterday's Open final, converted none of them. So Djokovic becomes the latest victim in Federer's relentless march through the record books, just too shy of Pete Sampras now. And I know you're probably wondering why we don't cover rugby more often. Let's switch to our Melbourne reporter. Well, Queensland support now shifts to the Cowboys, who overnight booked another home final. For the second week in a row, they had the Bulldogs on a leash. There we go. Broncos fans are all in disarray down here. They're tough, those rugby yeah, reporters. Yeah. That, that's a tough sport. He kept his composure after that time. Much better than I would have done. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Lee. Coming up, the rain report. Dennis's forecast is next. But first, here's a preview of what's ahead on NBC Nightly News. We'll have today's news out of Washington, of course, and tonight our special series, The Secrets to Her Success. Tonight, the risks women take with their health. That's nightly news coming up right here on News Channel 4. New York Nightly News with Chuck Scarborough at 7. Now, Chuck Scarborough brings you the news when you're actually at home to watch. NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams at 6.30. New York Nightly News with Chuck Scarborough, now at 7. NBC Tuesday. Anything is possible. Oh my God! 23 million calories burned. 6,500 pounds lost. Yes! Countless lives changed. I'm healthy now. I can't thank him enough for giving me my life back. And this season, there's a huge twist. Jillian is back. This is your last chance! The two-hour season premiere of The Biggest Loser, Tuesday, 8, 7 central on NBC. Closed captioning provided by Toyota, a smart way to keep moving forward. Well, we've had a pretty good run of great weather, yes. but that changed today. Janice is here with the forecast. Well, you know it was about to change, Linda, but we need the rain around here. 18 consecutive days in Central Park with no measurable rain until today, and there's more on the way tonight and tomorrow morning, unfortunately. We'll go outside and check things out as we look live across to Midtown, and you'll see that it's still hazy and murky and muggy out there, partly sunny and 76 degrees in Central Park. Doppler 4000, we've got some isolated showers to talk about. Not a whole lot on the radar right now. If you're up around Yorktown, you're seeing a heavy shower right now and south of West Milford. And there's been one lone shower, a thunderstorm that's been sitting over Barnegat, but now that's moving out to sea. Otherwise, there's not much going on right now, but there is more on the way. Back to the maps. We have winds out of the northeast at 6, humidity 85%, very stifling out there. We recorded 0.13 inches of rainfall in Central Park today, like I said, the first in 18 days. But you could see up to a half inch, maybe an inch in some spots by tomorrow afternoon, a high of 79 today. Right now, the temperatures are generally in the 70s to near 80 over interior New Jersey, 81 in Trenton right now, 80 Atlantic City, and near that in Caldwell at 78 at this hour. Time lapse showing clouds and spot showers over the area. Here's what's left of uh, Gabrielle, now a tropical depression moving out to sea, and then more rain back here in West Virginia. That's coming tonight and tomorrow morning. Gabrielle is just a tropical depression. It's moving away from us, south from us. We're not feeling the effects except the shore areas, but that will diminish as the storm continues to move out into the Atlantic. But stormy weather around here tomorrow, especially during the morning commute with that batch of rain area of low pressure moving along the front from West Virginia coming our way tonight, 78 for a high, a very muggy tropical day. But then it clears Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, sunshine highs in the 70s and a few more showers by Saturday. Let's look at weather. All right, thanks. Thank you, Janice. Now for the first time, we say Chuck is here with a look at what's ahead on New York Nightly News at 7 o'clock. Chuck? Well, David, coming up at 7, police officers, paramedics, construction workers, thousands say they suffered the health effects of 9-11, but were left hanging at 7. Why they have new reason to hope that somebody has their backs. And the city council defies Mayor Bloomberg over that school cell phone ban, so should students start bringing their phones to class now? Those stories are much more tonight at 7 on New York Nightly News. All right, look forward to seeing him then. NBC Nightly, no Nightly News with Brian Williams is up next. We'll see you tomorrow.